Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey there, church. You know, this is an interesting Sunday because this is Be the Church Sunday. And perhaps you saw the title of our sermon this week is Be the Church. But here's the reason for that. This Sunday, May 31st, was the date set aside for our Be the Church event with all the other churches in the community. And you might be saying, well, what is Be the Church Sunday? And so last year, we, with all the other churches in Elizabethtown, or the majority of churches in Elizabethtown, we met together in the Elizabethtown Community Park. We had over a thousand people come together for a time of prayer, led by a multitude of pastors from different churches, denominations, backgrounds. Uh, And then we had a message, we had worship in the park. And then the churches broke into small groups. And some of those small groups, many of those small groups were mixed from different churches and different backgrounds, different ethnicities. And those small groups went into the community to serve at various places. Last year, I went to the train station and painted a bunch of the railings and staircases, things like that. Some people mulched in the park. Other people uh, picked up trash or painted some of the railings in the town. But here's, here's what happened. The church was being the church in a way that it isn't normally being the church on a Sunday morning. Sunday morning for us uh, is set aside as our Sabbath time. We're, we set it aside so that we can kind of take a break, pause, a sela from everything that we normally do, and then we devote that time to God. It's our Sabbath. And uh, so normally we spend that time together in community and church, at teaching, prayer, that sort of thing. And this day, May 31st, was the day that we had planned to do that again with our community, and which was exciting. And so we decided to do this partnership series. And so over the last five weeks, we have worked through the book of Acts, talking about the importance of partnership. And the point of that was to lead us up to Be the Church Sunday, so that when we came together with these other churches, we knew that the, there was a biblical principle of partnering with others to spread the gospel and to love one another and to love the community. And so one of the biggest things that we were hoping that you would take from that series is that you won't see fellow Christians and fellow churches as competitors. And I know for some of you, you're like, whoa, why would you ever, why would you ever see that? Well, that is the way that We have seen one another historically. You know, there's only so many people that want to go to church, and so we're all striving to get the same kind of crowd of people. And and we just don't think that's a healthy model. We don't think that's a biblical principle. We don't think that's how Jesus would look at a community of people. And so we encouraged everyone not to see each other as competitors, but to see one another as partners as we moved into this Be the Church Sunday. Now, Be the Church Sunday this year is going to look a little bit different than other years because we're not gathering in the park. We had to cancel that activity and postpone it until the fall. And so we aren't gathering together and doing service projects right now with all the other churches and Christians in this town. And so Be the Church looks different. But we still think it's worth talking about what does it mean to be the church here and now today. And and next week, we're going to start a series called Together. And the series is actually designed to help us begin to get our hearts and our minds and our spirits in the right place to re-enter that communal worship, that together time. And so we're going to talk about community. We're going to talk about togetherness. We're going to talk about God's idea for that as a way to prepare ourselves. And so today is really a bridge between partnership and together. And so today we're really going to talk about what does it mean to be the church here and now today in the midst of the world that we're in. I want to talk a little bit this morning about something called dualistic thinking. And this is something that we've talked about before in one of our earlier series, uh, maybe this year or maybe last year. Um, 
And, and dualistic thinking is kind of like binary thinking. Uh, can you remember the movie The Matrix? And maybe if you saw it, you would remember that there's this moment when the main character is, is inside this kind of computer-generated world, and he sees things like we normally see it, but there's a moment when he finally kind of sees behind the curtain, so to say, and suddenly the walls and the people, they're full of ones and zeros everywhere. And so computer language, binary code is just ones and zeros. Everything develops out of different sequences of ones and zeros. Dualistic thinking is sort of like that binary code. It's, it's, it's just, it's either this or that. Dualistic thinking uses descriptors like good, evil, pretty, ugly, smart, stupid, not realizing that when we use these words, there may be hundreds of degrees of separation between these two things. The answer isn't good, bad. There's a paradigm in between where these are at the end of the paradigm and there's a whole lot of space between them. It's not ugly or pretty. There's a paradigm with a lot of space between them. Father Richard Rohr has done a lot of writing and thinking on this. And so if you're looking for a resource to explore dualism or dualistic thinking a little bit more, I wanna turn you on to Father Richard Rohr and the Center for Contemplation and Action, or Action and Contemplation. I'll put the website here on the screen. Feel free to check it out and you can do some reading about dualistic thinking. Father Richard Rohr says that dualism works well for the simplification and conversation, but not for the sake of truth or the immense subtlety of actual personal experience. What that means is that when we boil things down to just two options, the ones, the zeros, the right, the wrong, what we've done is we've said that all of human experience doesn't really matter. We're ignoring the fact that sometimes it's not right or wrong, there's this whole area in between it. Here's a perfect example, is lying right or wrong? Well, you and I would probably very quickly say lying's not okay. But in our series earlier this year, we studied the life of Abraham. Did we not see Abraham lie? Like clearly lie? Abraham lied about who his wife was. Somebody married his wife and who got in trouble? The person that married his wife and not Abraham. So was lying wrong? Well, maybe it's not as clear as lying is right or wrong. There's this whole paradigm in between it. And so when we just boil things down to this or that, ones or zeros, right or wrong, pretty or ugly, well, we actually are eliminating all this experience and that's not helpful. It's helpful to conversation, it's helpful to simplify things, but it's not necessarily helpful to looking at the truth of a situation. And that's what Father Richard Rohr is, is pointing out. And so he says this as well, we need a dualistic mind to do our work as a teacher, scientist, nurse, or engineer. We need it for as far as it will go, but it doesn't go far enough. Dualistic thinking doesn't go far enough. And that's part of what Jesus came to really engage us on in this world. When he did his ministry on earth, he encountered dualistic thinking all over the place. And so Jesus engaged that by kind of opening our minds to a third way. If dualism means that there is this way or this way, Jesus often came into a situation and he didn't choose this and he didn't choose this. He found a third way in that situation. And historically, Anabaptists, which is the kind of the background, the theological background that the Brethren of Christ would fit into, Anabaptists have been called third way people. And so we want to continue exploring this idea of third way. As, and we talk about what does it mean to be the church here and now today? Well, part of being the church is not getting stuck in dualistic thinking. Part of being the church is realizing there's a third way in so many of the situations. I want you to think of, you know, um, think of it like an operating system. When you realize that you aren't stuck with just two options, it's like you have been given a new operating system for your world and you can see things anew. It's kind of like, um, like you, you realize there's this computer or there's this computer. 
And, and aren't they about as different as they could be? When you get the new operating system, it's like, oh, I've always been kind of in this thing and I've been limited by what this can do. Suddenly, now I can see things completely differently. There's a screen with color even. You know, uh, when you are realize that there is a third option in many of the situations where it feels like there's only two options, it's kind of like um, when you go from a rotary phone, remember those? to going to a cell phone we have now today. The rotary phone was great for the time that it was in. It let you call people. But the cell phones we have today, they let you call people, they let you video chat with people, they give you access to the internet, you can do games, you can do your work, you can write on them. I mean, there's, it just, it unveils an entirely new world when you realize you don't have to be stuck with just two options. There is a third way that is possible if you allow it to be. Now, I believe that Jesus shows us perfectly who God always was. I'm gonna say that again. I believe that Jesus shows us perfectly who God always was. He is the perfect image of God. Neither God nor Jesus has ever been stuck or resigned to dualistic thinking as they comprehend the vastness that is this universe created by God, they've never been stuck in dualistic thinking. It's ones, it's zeros, it's this or that. They understand the spectrum better than anyone that is. Jesus came to this earth, and what I want to do today is I want to just look at one example from each gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So four examples this morning of times that Jesus entered into a situation, and rather than being resigned or stuck in a dualistic situation, Jesus shows us a third way. And I believe that this will give us some good ideas. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to speak to each of us about um, how these situations translate to our lives and will expand our mind into thinking about how we are to be the church here and now today. So let's go first to the book of Mark, and we're going to chapter 1, verse 16 to 20. Let's read this together. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Okay. So this is the, the stereotypical story that we get of Jesus calling his disciples. He approaches them. They're fishing on a boat. They're fishermen. These aren't just trained disciples. So here's the dualistic thinking piece. The dualistic thinking is pass or fail. You see, the only reason that these guys would be fishing is because they are dropouts, essentially. Every Jewish boy had to go to school to learn the scriptures. And the workload that they had, the education that they needed, the memor I mean, the sheer memorization that they had to do is staggering. I mean, they had to memorize the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of our Bible. And at some point, if they didn't have that memorized, then they were rejected. And so the teachers would come to them and say something like, it would be better for you to return home and ply your family trade. It's a nice way of saying, you're not cut out to be a disciple or a rabbi, so go home and get a job with your family. Whatever your family does, learn from them and take over the family business. So the disciples, the mere fact that they are fishing on a boat means that they had gone to school and they didn't make it. They weren't good enough. They hadn't passed. They had failed. And so the dualistic approach to looking at this would be for Jesus to say, okay, these are failures. Um, it's good enough or not good enough. These guys are not good enough. But Jesus doesn't enter the situation and he's not okay with that. Jesus entered the situation and he calls these men who were, uh, who were titled not good enough, who were titled dropouts or failures, 
and he said, I want you to follow me. If you follow me, I will teach you how to be fishers of men. Jesus didn't accept the good enough or not good enough, the pass or the fail. Jesus said, I want you. I'm going to call you, and I will prepare those who I have called. Jesus doesn't call the prepared. Jesus prepares the people he calls. And so he says, come, and I will teach you to be fishers of men. He doesn't say, come, and I will teach you to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Though that may have happened in all of the time that they were together. Perhaps. He says, come, and I will teach you how to be fishers of men. Jesus shows us a third way, simply in the way that we view the people the society has seen fit to label as not good enough, to label as failures. Let's go to our second story. This is in John chapter 8. And if you watched the devotional this week, then I talked about this story in the devotional. But if you didn't, then this will be uh, kind of a fresh up uh, in John chapter 8 of the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. And so let's read this together. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, we are commanded to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So this is kind of, it's kind of a normal day for Jesus where he's in the temple teaching and, and he's kind of interrupted from his teaching time because the teachers of the law drag a woman into the center of his teaching area and center of the temple courts and they throw her at his feet. In all likelihood, this woman is probably half naked because she's been caught in the middle of adultery. And so if that's happened, literally, which is the way the text reads, then she hasn't had the time to get, get a covering or, or anything like that. And so she's probably huddled at his feet, doing her very best to cover herself up. And so they are embarrassing this woman drastically, but they're also embarrassing Jesus because they've cast a half naked woman at his feet. And so they clearly are trying to trap Jesus. They say, look, Jesus, the law of Moses says that we should kill her for being an adulterer. If you're the law, if you're the fulfillment of the law, then, well, what do you say? And so the assumption is that either Jesus can say, stone her, or he's going to say, reject the law you've been given. There's a binary way of thinking. There's a dualistic way of thinking. There's two options here. Jesus, we stone her, and then people are going to be upset because you've been saying that you're all about love, and you've been kind of flipping the script, so to say, on all that we've been told and taught. Your followers are going to riot if you say that. Of course, if you say that we shouldn't do what the law says, everyone else is going to riot too, and we'll stone you. So Jesus is stuck in this predicament where there's only two options. But Jesus, once again, Jesus being the perfect image of God, isn't stuck in dualistic thinking. That's not where he lands. There is a third way. And so what does he do? Once again, Jesus flips the script and he says, look, if you have never sinned, then you can cast the first stone. If you've never sinned, you cast the first stone. And by doing this, Jesus is not countering the law of Moses. He's not saying, don't follow this. What he's saying is, you have a right to follow this if you've never sinned. And the only person standing there who hasn't sinned is Jesus. There's only one person standing there. And so let's just talk about this. Who's standing there? 
You have a crowd of men and women. There are some Jewish and some Gentile. There are experts in the law, like lawyers, and there are religious elite, like Pharisees and Sadducees. And Jesus is saying, the only one of you that has the right to judge or condemn is the one of you who is without sin. Once again, Jesus flips the script. And so people who have spent a lifetime putting themselves in the seat of judgment, like Pharisees, Sadducees, the culturally elite, the Jews, Jesus is saying, that seat isn't your seat. That seat is my seat. So get out of the seat of judgment and recognize that none of you are perfect. You all have sinned, and you are no better than this woman. So if anybody has the right to condemn her, it's me. And so what happens? They drop their stones, and they walk away. And Jesus helps this woman to her feet and says, Woman, where are your accusers? Are any of them here? And she's like, No, they're all gone. He's like, Is there anybody left to condemn you? And she's like, No, no one's left to condemn me. And then Jesus says this. Remember, Jesus is the only one with the power here, the only one with the power to sit in the seat of judgment. And Jesus says, Well, then neither do I condemn you. Now, does he let her off the hook completely? No, he says to her, Go and leave your life of sin. Jesus is essentially saying, like, look, I've shown you a new way in this moment. You've experienced mercy and grace and love like you have never experienced it before. So take this example with you as you go and live differently than you have lived before. And so Jesus takes this opportunity. Um, well, he takes the situation and turns it into an opportunity, right? He takes a situation where the teachers of the law, the smartest men, think they've trapped him in this two-option sort of situation. And Jesus flips it and says, there's a third way. I'm going to turn it into an opportunity to speak to this woman about love, grace, and mercy, and then send her out of here with a message that she would never have gotten from any of the people in that crowd. Whoa! How cool is that? Jesus just takes us right out of dualistic thinking and right into a third-way example. All right, let's go to our next one. Our example three is in Matthew chapter five. This is, the, um, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Let me pull this up in my Bible. And, uh, and so Jesus flips the script once again on us. It's kind of phenomenal when we think about all that Jesus did when he came. The way that he taught and the way that he acted and the way that he shared about who God was completely, completely changes who we think God is. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Here we have Jesus directly encountering the law of Moses. So we, we had him just encounter that with the woman caught in adultery, right? They're trying to trap him with the law. But here, this isn't a trap. Jesus is kind of bringing this up on his own terms. Now remember, I said this at the beginning. I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus is the perfect image of God. Jesus perfectly shows us who God truly is. So that means that God's heart has always been Love of enemy, always. Now let's go back in time. In the time of Moses, if, if somebody came and they killed your, your cattle, then you might go and kill their family. And then their 
relatives might come and destroy your village. And then your extended relatives might come back and wage war on their nation. And do you understand how the way that we got revenge on one another way back when just led to worse and worse and greater and greater violence in every situation? When Moses comes and gives the Israelites this word of God, this law of God, what he was saying is, all right, retribution needs to be fair. If somebody comes and they kill your cattle, you don't get to go and kill their family. You can kill their cattle. If somebody comes and they stab you in your eye, you don't get to kill them or cut off their leg. You get to stab them in the eye. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Moses was trying to make it fair, and he was trying to create a line in the sand to say, look, the way we've always done it, where it gets worse and worse and worse and worse, that's not okay, and that's not of God's heart. And so there was a time and a place for this law. It went from this dualistic way of thinking of kill or be killed to a fair punishment. Of course, as Jesus encounters the system, now the dualistic thinking is kill or fairly punish, right? Right? Well, Jesus enters into this and says, look, I'm telling you there's a different way yet. It's not kill and get worse and worse and worse or fair punishment. Actually, if somebody slaps you in your cheek, I want you to turn the other cheek. If somebody forces you to carry their bag for one mile, then I want you to just keep going at the end of the mile and carry it for two miles. If you have an enemy... I know it says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But if you have an enemy, I don't want you to just love your neighbor because everybody does that. Even, even the people who are not Christians, the pagans, well, they love the people who love them. No, no, no. What's going to set apart the followers of God is when we love our enemies as much as we love our neighbors. So don't just love your neighbor as yourself. Also love your enemy. And so this idea of love, of enemy love, this isn't just a Jesus thing. This is Jesus showing us who God always was. And finally, we're ready for it. The third way is love. We're going to come back to this uh, as we conclude our service. Here's our last example. We're going to go to the ch uh, book of Luke, chapter 23, verse 44 to 48. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Jesus on the cross. I mean, everything boils down to Christ and Christ crucified. Christ resurrected. Jesus on the cross is sort of the culmination of a dualistic system being put to death. You see, the law governed everything. And so Jesus could either go with the law or he could go against the law. And there have been many who had came before Jesus who had gone against the law. They had created um, all sorts of rebellions. And many people had died in these rebellions where they rebelled against Rome. And in fact, the Jewish people, when they thought about the Messiah coming to rescue them, they assumed that the Messiah would be a guy wielding a sword, leading people in battle to free them from the Roman occupation. They thought it would be violent. So... The, the choice Jesus had was to go against the law, lead a rebellion, be a zealot. Or he could go with the law. And, well, going with the law really meant becoming a Pharisee, a Sadducee. These were people that had devoted their entire lives to going with the law. But Jesus, again, the perfect image of God, will not be locked into dualism. Jesus sees the third way in this, and this is his whole life. He's the fulfillment of the law. 
He's not going against it. He's not going with it. He is fulfilling it. And so on the cross here in this story, he shouts out as he is breathing his last breath, it is finished. And what is finished? A dualistic way of thinking, a system of law, of being in or out, of, of breaking it or not breaking it, of being a hypocrite or, or being trampled by it. Jesus fulfills it. He brings it to completion. And he leaves us with a new law. And that law is love. What does it mean to be the church today? Here and now, in this time of quarantine, what does it mean to be the church? It means taking on the mantle of Jesus. That we take on his name. That we take on his his words, his deeds. We are his hands and we are his feet to the world around us. And all of this, his words, his deeds, his hands, his feet, his actions, his thoughts, all of this can be summed up in love. The language of God, the language of Jesus is love. God is love. And so what does it mean to be the church here and now today? It means to love one another. It means to love your neighbor as yourself. And it means to love your enemy. Folks, it means to love your enemy. Do you understand that Jesus has flipped the script for us? It's not just about loving those who love you. It's not just about loving those who are like you. It is about loving people who are very different than you, about loving people who don't agree with you, who don't see eye to eye with you, who don't even look like you or smell like you or act like you or talk like you. God's language is the language of love. And if we aren't loving, then we aren't being the church. We are not the bride of Christ, and we are not following Jesus. The language of love must rang preeminent in our lives. Friends, join me, because this is where it starts. We can't live in a world where people are forgotten and lost. They remain faceless and nameless. We can't live in a world where our, our black men are terrified to go on a jog. We can't live in a world where there are homeless sitting on the corner and they don't know where their next meal is coming from. We can't live in a world where the foster care system is so full they don't know what to do with all the children there. We can't live in a world where people are just continually addicted to drugs. We must enter into it and help because the dualistic thinking that we're stuck in is either ignore it or be a part of it. And Jesus is saying, no, enter into it and be love. Speak love. Act in love. Touch in love. Love is the language of God. We must love. Friends, we love by speaking up. We love by praying for. We love by mourning with. We love by asking for forgiveness. We love by teaching our children better than we were taught. We love by using our bodies as shields. We love by using our power for advocacy and not as power over others. We love by setting aside our privilege. We love by passing the mic. We love by partnering with others and we love by being together. We love by acting like Jesus as much as is possible every single day. My friends, the language of God that is spoken and understood all throughout this universe is love. To be the church means to love. So let us love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, my prayer is so simple on this morning. May your Holy Spirit take a hold of our hearts, our minds, our words, our hands and our feet. And may you show us how, where, and when to love. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me, God. Amen.
Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together. Thank you.